therefore, we decided to start a series of webinars to give a chance to everybody to share their innovations. And today we have three presentations from three of our partner universities. The University of Oviedo, Spain, Munster Technological University in Ireland, and University of Schöfde in Sweden. And each presentation will take about 15 minutes. And after that, we will have about five minutes for, for questions and comment. And of course, you can uh, write questions also in the chat along the way. Okay, so first, I would like to give the floor to Ignacio Rodriguez Larad from Oviedo. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So hopefully everybody can, can see my screen now, correct? Yes, we Perfect. can see that fine. Thank you very much. So uh, as you introduce, I belong to one of the engineering universities, University of Oviedo in Spain. And uh, just to provide some background for this presentation, uh, I joined the University of Oviedo in 2022. So only uh, uh, to develop my career uh, at Albert University, Denmark, uh, where I have worked for over 10 years uh, there. So uh, if you're aware of that, uh, Albert University is one of the reference uh, uh, universities in Europe uh, for uh, project-based learning for PBL. So actually, one of the things that I'm trying to do now that I joined, the, let's say, one of the traditional learning uh, universities here in Spain is to bring those uh, knowledge of uh, PBL in practice to, to my university. So one of the first things that I have done uh, uh, when I joined here at the University of Oviedo, it was, uh, let's say, to join efforts with some colleagues from different uh, areas of knowledge. Uh, myself, I'm from uh, telecommunications, so uh, electrical and electronic engineering. Uh, and for this work, I joined efforts uh, with a colleague from computer science and a colleague from uh, construction and materials. So that we start to do, let's say, through uh, multidisciplinary work uh, with the students. So what we have done here, and I will try to explain the title very briefly, is that uh, we have set an IoT project, and by IoT, I, I refer to Internet of Things. So we have created a, a project where students from different educations uh, with different maturity levels, because they belong to a, a bachelor or master uh, education, so they are at a different uh, period of, of their studies, have to build a, a kind of sensor integrated with wireless technology, and they should be able to report, let's say, temperature, pressure, and humidity, so very standard uh, climate uh, parameters, to an online backend, right? But this is a real project, right? It could be something that they could be developing in their future careers at any uh, company doing this kind of, uh, of products. So we're integrating multidisciplinary and multi-education uh, work. Uh, each of the educations, uh, uh, they bring a number of uh, uh, knowledge, expert knowledge and competences within the project, and they have to coordinate themselves in order to build uh, this uh, device. And also, let's say, they have to share knowledge uh, between the different uh, peers from the different uh, educations. And of course, we have the engineering students uh, as part of, uh, of this. So what we are putting together here is basically PBL. Uh, we have multidisciplinary learning. We have cooperative learning. We try to instruct the students uh, to make active listening, critical thinking. We believe socialization is uh, an important part of this type uh, of projects. And as I will explain uh, later, we have combined the uh, two methodologies. Uh, that is uh, unsupervised uh, project work, where the students, they work on their own in their groups. And then we have supervised learning. So we have uh, developed a number of workshops where we try to monitor the progress of the, of the, of the work. So uh, as I mentioned, we are putting together students from three different educations, and then they have different roles within the project. So we have uh, some students from the uh, Master of Telecommunications that uh, they are the hardware, software integrations and programmers for this uh, uh, sensor that uh, we instructed them that they have to do as part of the project. Then we have uh, uh, GTELE, uh, that's uh, students from the Bachelor of Telecommunications. 
And this is a very special role which we have defined for them because they are the network technology advisors. And as you may see, I'm highlighting that these people, they are volunteers. So we are adding, let's say, another degree of freedom to our uh, activity. And is that some of the students, uh, apart from being from different educations, some of them, in concrete, uh, this group uh, from Jai uh, Tele, they are volunteers. So we have a, a multidisciplinary, multi-education project where we have a, a, a students that uh, is a mandatory activity for them and others that are volunteer. And as I will explain later, this creates a number of, uh, uh, let's say, interactions or interesting interactions be between them. And then we have uh, people from the uh, Bachelor of, uh, of uh, Mechanical Engineering that they are the structure designers, right? So as you may see already from the roles that we are giving to the different uh, students from different educations, they have different roles in the project as uh, it would be in any company working on this, on this area. The project is structured over two months. Uh, that's, let's say, kind of the uh, effective uh, first semester time that we have to, uh, to implement this. As I said, uh, uh, it's based on unsupervised work. So uh, we make groups of students where they are said, OK, you need to do this. Sorry. You need to, to do this uh, sensor and, and so on. And then there will be three supervised sessions. That's the first, uh, second, and third workshop where we have different uh, purposes for this. So in the supervised uh, workshops, we have one introductory one where we make the groups and uh, make some activities so that the students get to know each other and, and, and what they know, what they don't know. Then we have an intermediate workshop where we are progress uh, monitoring what they are doing. And then we have a final product presentation where the students should, have, should come and present what they have developed uh, uh, through the activity. Uh, we also offer them uh, offline support. Uh, this means that they have uh, our email addresses and they are explicitly told if you have any question related to our areas of expertise, please just uh, drop an email. Uh, I will uh, insist in this uh, later a little bit more, but uh, actually we got no questions uh, from them during the activity, so they make no, no, uh, not use of this uh, support that we offer uh, to them. Uh, I will simply summarize uh, uh, in this uh, uh, brief presentation just the, the outcomes of of the activity, right? So I have explained how it was structured, what they have to do, the unsupervised work and the supervised lectures. And then we're going to take a look to the main learning objectives. So I think it's interesting that uh, in general, so uh, more than 86%, they believe that the project has uh, provided them with a learning experience that is representative of what they will encounter in the future professional career, right? So they got a positive uh, perception of this uh, multidisciplinary work. And they have already faced, let's say, uh, some of the interactions they will face in the future companies when they need to, let's say, talk or share knowledge with uh, people from different uh, backgrounds. If we take a look uh, to the learning uh, perception, and uh, uh, I'm referring to the perception because we actually didn't test uh, uh, if they really acquire knowledge uh, uh, in, this, in this area. So we are simply asking what is the perception of the knowledge they have in the different areas. And uh, we evaluated this prior to the project and after the project, right? So uh, our hypothesis was they should increment the knowledge in those areas that they are not, uh, that is not related to their studies, right? So for example, the people uh, from mechanical engineer, they should increase uh, not only the, the knowledge in, in the typical areas uh, related to that, that would be the industrial design and the 3D, and the 3D printing, but they also should learn also something about the wireless technology they are using to program microcontrollers, something about networks. So that's what we were expecting, right? That uh, kind of all the perception of knowledge should uh, move towards the, the right so that they get some uh, uh, per uh, perceptions of learnings in all the areas. And what it was interesting to find is that uh, the students from the master, uh, so the ones that they are more mature, they seem to have fulfilled this, right? Uh, so they have been, they have uh, the perception that they have acquired uh, knowledge in all the areas, right? So we compare initial and final, you can see how clearly the bars, they are moving towards the right and they become more green. On the other hand, the people from the uh, bachelor, so in telecommunications, they actually uh, learn mainly or expand the knowledge in the areas that they are more related to the same area. 
So you can see that, uh, for example, industrial design and 3D printing is not moving too much towards the, the right, right? So those uh, competences that are not directly uh, for related to their studies, they didn't acquire uh, so many. And the same happened uh, for the people from mechanics. So they have developed further the competences from their own field of studies, but the ones that are related to the other studies, in this case, telecommunications, they gain a little bit, but not so much, right? So that's why we make this uh, uh, observation, right? That uh, it seems that more mature students, the one from the master, they uh, they got the, per the perception, or at least they make uh, more use uh, to acquire competences outside of their main areas of, of expertise, while the people in the bachelor, they didn't. If we take a look to the satisfaction and professional competences, uh, again, they believe that it was uh, very interesting to have this type of, of project. And then we ask them satisfaction about the specific uh, parts uh, or the specific uh, items uh, related to the project, right? So as you can see, they, they were very satisfied with the individual work, with the group collaboration, with the hardware and software availability. But as you can see here, the, the less satisfaction it was actually with the teacher support. And this is something we noticed. And that's why I, I, I told you uh, before that uh, the teacher support was offered in two ways, right? One, of course, it was during the supervised uh, workshops. And the other, it was kind of this uh, offline remote uh, support. So we were expecting them every time they were facing an issue, as it will happen in any company, just notify your manager, right? And this uh, didn't happen through the project. So this is something that for next editions, because this activity will, re will be repeated uh, in, in the coming two years, uh, we'll have to, to address a little bit. Uh, it was interesting also that they feel more prepared to tackle multidisciplinary work uh, after the, the, the run of the activity. They also believe uh, that they will be, uh, 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 yeah, that this kind of multidisciplinary engineering knowledge is something that they will be required in their future works. But also, it was interesting to see these uh, uh, results that we find here, right? So uh, initially, uh, before the project, so in the workshop number one, where we make the groups and explain the activity and everything, they were kind of motivated, right? The overall, you can see that is a, a balance toward the positive uh, uh, side of the of the ranking. While after the project, so despite the high fund, they have found that the project was very interesting and useful for their career, they were actually not motivated according to what we got in the in the results from the questionnaires. So this is also another thing that we need uh, to address a little bit in, in future uh, runs of the of the activity. So it was interesting to notice those uh, two, two things here. Then we have, of course, some uh, number of observations directly from the from the teachers uh, uh, for the supervised sessions. And in the first one, uh, as I mentioned, it was for making introduction to the activity, establish the groups, uh, uh, and give some the materials that they uh, were going to use during the activity. We proposed a number of ice-breaking exercises, so we were making uh, them to socialize and introduce each other. Everything was good. In the second workshop, where we uh, made some intermediate presentations, here we, we set the focus, let's say, not too much on the technical part, but more so that they have to explain to us how they were uh, uh, organizing themselves, right? How they were, uh, what are, were the different roles that the different students were using, what tools they were using to, to communicate, if they were having regular meetings or offline meetings or how they were doing this, right? In general, all the groups, they organize in the same way. They have some uh, uh, presential meetings a number of times uh, uh, per week or two weeks. And then they were uh, talking over WhatsApp or having a OneDrive where they could share some of the information. Th that's the, the trend uh, that they have been normally using. Uh, here, we actually noticed that one of the groups uh, was actually behind the others, right? Uh, uh, it was very interesting that this group, we noticed that they were delayed, but actually the presentation was amazing. So they were having like marketing-like uh, presentation with a lot of nice visuals and videos, and it looked very professional. But technically, or in terms of organization, we were noticing some problems here. Uh, 
in this objective of this pilot trial, we didn't want to do any, anything, right? So we just wanted, uh, we have decided that everything will be unsupervised except in these uh, sessions. So we just wanted to see, okay, what happens if we leave this uh, group now go to the end, right? Don't tell them anything. They get some feedback uh, about the presentation, but we don't say anything else, right? We don't offer any help or, or, or anything. And then what happened in the end in the final workshop is that actually uh, uh, what we were suspecting that this group was delayed, it actually uh, showed also in the final presentation. So two out of three groups, they were very successful with the presentations, uh, very good technically and so on. But the final group, they didn't manage to implement fully the product that we have uh, asked them to do. So actually they carry that uh, uh, delay that we noticed uh, already in the intermediate meeting. And this is something that probably we can take a look next year, maybe introducing, uh, I don't know, some specific face-to-face uh, uh, -face meeting with the groups in between the, the workshops, just to be a little bit more on top and guarantee that all the groups, they make a successful uh, implementation. Uh, it was also very interesting to see that uh, when we are arriving to the final of the project, so let's say between workshop two and three, remember those volunteers that I was uh, telling you at the beginning, everything was good uh, for them between uh, workshop one and workshop two, but between workshop two and workshop three, when the students, the, mandate, the ones that uh, they have this activity as mandatory for their studies, they start to feel the pressure that uh, the final presentation is coming and we have to make a product uh, then they actually uh, put the volunteers a little bit aside, right? So we found that they were not invited to some of the meetings or they were working in parallel without uh, notifying the volunteers that this was uh, uh, happening simply because they consider that uh, since the volunteers, uh, this was not uh, uh, graded for them, then they were not going to perform as good as the non-volunteers, right? So this is something that uh, we have to try to balance or, or see in the future uh, editions of the of the activity. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to be running this activity for another two years. So actually, we, we got some funding to, to do this. So uh, we established a project that is called Enabling Next Generation Network Infrastructures for Learning, because we are using uh, network infrastructures or network communications uh, yeah, to make this kind of multidisciplinary, multi-education work. And uh, we have to tackle these uh, things that uh, uh, I mentioned briefly to you, right? So the issues between volunteers and non-volunteers, to be a little bit more on top, uh, uh, maybe not only in the unsupervised, in the supervised uh, uh, lectures. Uh, yeah, maybe they need a little bit more of introduction to the hardware and software. We don't uh, really know. Mm, we were actually discussing uh, if maybe uh, including yet another education into this. So now we have mainly telecommunications and, and, uh, and mechanical engineering. So we are discussing maybe uh, if we can include someone with background in electronics, in, in pure electronics. So we see that there is some path that we can still uh, cover here to make the, uh, the activity more successful, right? And yeah, we'd like to report this, that it was successful, but there were a number of things that they were maybe negative and we want to share with you and yeah, try to correct in future editions of the activity. So I hope I was in time. Thank you for your attention and more than glad to yeah, have your feedback or questions, comments if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ignacio. I think it was a very impressive learning design. Thank and you. now, um, Ignacio, I you stop your share. Thank you very much. If you have any comments or questions. I had a question, um, Tina, there just for Ignacio around the, do you think that if the, if the supervision was supplied, you know, face to face, that more students would attend the face to face supervision as opposed to an online remote supervision? Uh, we believe so, uh, at least, and I think this is something related, let's say, to the Spanish system or the Spanish way of doing things. Uh, I think the students, they are used to this kind of traditional uh, lecturing more than having practical activities. And normally, yeah, they, I don't know if, say, they, they feel more pressure or, or they think it's more important when the teacher is present, right? So I think this face-to-face -face is actually something that, uh, yeah, here we work. So... Yeah, we'll see in the next edition. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. May I add in a comment? I'm not totally yes. sure of this uh, hand raising <laughs> buttons here. But thank you very much. This is very, very inspiring example. And uh, I think that this kind of work-based learning is, is very much in core when we are educating our students to the needs of the working life. And uh, especially this kind of multidisciplinary working is, is very, uh, very important. And I would uh, even call it crucial in, in, uh, in our uh, working life. Uh, or, or in our working life competencies. Uh, I was wondering that uh, for the future, have you had any thoughts of uh, widening this multidisciplinary approach from the engineering sciences to some other sciences? Yes, uh, I always have that in mind. So as I said, uh, before joining the University of Oviedo, I was working for Oval University, where engineers is very tight, let's say, with uh, philosophy and uh, uh, social uh, education and so on. So that's what I would hope here. Uh, the thing is that in Spain is quite difficult to change the way things are done here. So I have just been here for two years, but my goal would be to do that because, uh, and actually that's what we can see also in the European projects, right? That now you need a very large consortium where they have uh, this kind of backgrounds uh, spanning all the fields and not only pure engineer or pure social or pure uh, philosophic, right? So. For sure. And uh, I think it's a pity because I haven't found that in my university there is a, a, a techno-anthropology. This is something that in all, but it was very uh, well established. And it was always interesting as engineers to talk to the people in techno-anthropology and how the uh, technology would impact uh, society and, and so on. And I would love to do the same here, but uh, yeah, a small step uh, at the time. But yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ignacio. If you still have some questions for, for him, you can write them in the chat. Exactly, thank you. And uh, I will now give the floor to Thomas Broderick and Ima Foley from Münster Univers uh, Technological University. And um, just confirm that everyone can see, you can see the screen there. Yes, we can see. Thanks, Tina. So first of all, thank you very much, Tina, for the opportunity. And uh, thank you also, Nasser, for his presentation. Uh, my name is Thomas Broderick. I'm a lecturer and senior fellow in the um, Department of Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies. And I'm joined um, today by my colleague, Emer Foley, who's head of section in the Department of Health and Leisure Studies. Um, another person who was involved in this project was Dr. Con Burns, who's a senior lecturer in, in the department as well, but he couldn't be with us today, but we need to acknowledge him as well. Um, so, first of all, um, we're from Most Technological University, which is, I suppose, a multi-campus technology university <clears throat> with six campuses and a kind of student body of around 18,000 students. So that's just where we're coming from. And you can see a few images there of, of um, our different campuses, all taken in the finest weather, of course. Um, where we are, we're in the southwest of Ireland. Um, in the Cork and Kerry region. So if you ever are over here, maybe it might be an opportunity to kiss the Blarney Stone or ease in the Arena Market or go for a cycle in the Ring of Kerry or golf in Tralee. So um, that's our tourism in Ireland pitch there for people. If you ever come over here, you're always very welcome. Um, our context, but just to keep you before we outline the project, maybe that we did just give you an idea. The students that we work with are in the area of sport, health, exercise and physical education. So we end up assessing and giving students to our feedback in these, I suppose, applied settings like sports halls and swimming pools and track and field, schools, gyms, football pitches, etc. So that's maybe when we when you out when we outline the project, maybe just think about those applied um settings. So I suppose the challenge in terms of like probably what we're all having in terms of maybe giving students feedback or assessing students is that we were finding that sometimes the students weren't clear on, on rubrics that we were, you know, using to give to assess them and give them feedback, or they weren't sure exactly of what the criteria that they were being assessed on. And we have staff, you know, across our programs, maybe using different grade points to step students and give feedback. So we were kind of thinking that this could be maybe confusing, and we were hearing that this could be challenging for our students then in terms of the different types of grades they were getting and the different feedback they were getting. And 
it kind of maybe led to maybe an ad hoc approach to giving feedback to students at different times during the module. So these were a few challenges we were seeing and also like maybe staff using different rubrics to assess students in, in practical modules, which, you know, maybe from a student point of view is not really student friendly in terms of them seeing different grade points and different rubrics. So we knew some of these problems existed and we wanted to maybe look about how we could do something about it. So um, we got funding to a project just to maybe develop or co-create um, an assessment rubric, rubric with students and that could be used in various and different practical modules across a number of our courses. So I suppose the first thing we did, um, we got funding for the project and um, we we decided that we try and review current rubrics to see what, how were our staff currently assessing students and could we identify common themes across all these kind of practical applied settings like the one I mentioned there, the sports coaching, physical education, teaching, and could we identify common themes that came up? And um, we will show you what that might look like in a second. Then we sat down with students and we tried to co-create with students in classes and in lectures and um, these criteria so that students and staff were very clear on what they were going to be graded on and actually giving them an opportunity to have impact and to influence what they're going to be graded on. And I think this was a nice way to, you know, build positive relations with students and get an, get an idea of what they wanted to work on or what they felt was important and what skills they might need um, as they progress through through the course. We piloted this new um, rubric, and we'll show you to in a second, in three mediums. So we want to try and give autonomy to staff within. We're finding that a lot of our staff are using maybe pen and paper. Some are using Excel and very efficient in Excel, and some mark and our students using our learning management system canvas. So we wanted to see how this rubric worked in those three spaces also. And then as part of this evaluation um, process, we just got feedback from students and from staff about how they felt it worked. So I'm gonna hand you over to my colleague, Emer Foley, just to talk about maybe what the project looked like in practice. Hello everyone. Um, so my name is Emer and thank you, Tom, for the introduction. So what it looks like in practice, um, so once we identified, I suppose we tried to identify the common criteria across an, a range of, of programs, a range of modules and in, in two different parts of our college. So I'm based in Kerry, uh, Tom is up in Cork, um, but we, we teach on kind of similar modules, similar modules that would have similar criteria. Um, and we were able to see across lots of different modules that there was a common set of, of themes. It actually was, it wasn't as difficult a challenge to kind of uh, ca categorize the themes that came up. Um, what I suppose where we put a lot of our work into was the language being used and the kind of descriptions within those themes. So here is an example of the Excel uh, rubric that we developed. And this, so this Excel rubric has six main headings or main criteria and these these six criteria were those that that really stood out from all the modules um, that we are commonly assessing in practicals and you'll see for this example here you have things like um, the students in use of instructions demonstrations um, the content of their activities their group management so that's just a, a, a few examples and what you can see then is there are different descriptions for, for each. And those descriptions um, we found might change from module to module. So maybe the overall theme is, is the same within the modules, but within different assessments, the description then might change. And this is where we'd like to give the staff that individuality and flexibility to, um, I suppose, co-create their own version of the rubric while staying on, on par with the kind of general rubric. And we felt that this, this rubric will help then the students to become more familiar with the look of it and the feel of it so that this will help them then in, in preparation across multiple modules. Um, the other thing then to point out, um, Tom alluded to, was the five point grading scheme. So you will see at the top, 
from excellent uh, right down to very poor. Um, again, this is trying to get a consistent um, banding system in place so that, again, the students become very familiar with um, the, the kind of breakdown of our marks. Um, so this, this is a good, a really good step in trying to um, bring us to a consistent approach. So this is the Excel file version, and, and this is what we started with for all of our practice. Um, then, you know, when we try to use it or evaluate it in, in our different settings, um, I think Tom used this Excel sheet, um, Khan, one, someone used a tablet. So if you can imagine yourself out in a sports hall or maybe out on a football pitch, um, you might need to use pen and paper. You might not be able to bring your laptop with you. So we had to make this very flexible. Um, so, th so if you move on there to the next slide, um, I'm just going to show you the Canvas version. So I try to use the Canvas version in um, my practical exam, which took place in an aerobic dance studio. So I was able to use my laptop and actually do the feedback and the live scoring directly into Canvas, which I suppose is, is a very efficient way of doing it because this feedback then is 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 available to the students pretty much um, instantaneously straight after the assessment, which helps then to provide um, good feedback very quickly. So I, I use the exact same rubric. Um, you'll see on the left hand side the, the, the themes. Um, you can see there that I, I use slightly different weightings. So I have 15%, 20% and so on. And this allows me then to have a little bit more flexibility for my particular assessment. And this is a student's uh, results. So you can see how I was adding the comments and the the, the marks as I as I went along. So it 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 became you know quite usable um, in the Canvas system as well. So not just on your pen and paper, um, it also transfers not quite nicely into Canvas. Um, so if you just we're just going to look at so what did the students think of all of this? So we went to, to the students um, at the end of the, the terms, the end of the semesters to assess, and we used Gibbs uh, assessment experience questionnaire. So we found that there was a very high percentage that found the rubric did help focus their efforts on the key criteria. So along with the co-creation piece so in class asking the students to help identify those criteria they agreed that that helps to focus their efforts they also felt that they were quite involved and engaged in that rubric development and you know the that that's a positive step if, if we can get the students more and more involved um, in that experience um, if we move on then to the next set of results um, i think for for staff by using this uh, co-creation method and this rubric, it helps with actually um, piecing in the feedback and, and adding that feedback method within our modules. And you can see 88% agreed that they got plenty of feedback on how they were doing. Um, so that feedback sometimes was in person, sometimes it was written feedback, and sometimes I use the audio tool on Canvas to actually record um, a bit of feedback, which in practical assessments, if, if any of you use practical assessments, um, sometimes you do need to speak to the students, but sometimes it's not always possible to speak, you know, personally to the students. That audio feedback through Canvas or through some of these systems is very helpful um, because it, it just really adds the personal approach to, to giving them that feedback. Um, then also um, there was the, the staff focus group feedback. So we asked staff at the end, um, how did they find it? And um, you know, this comment, if you want to read it, um, it, it really helps with the clarity of the criteria. So it helps to focus the staff also on the key focus points and, and the criteria. So it, it, it made it simpler, I think, and more clear. Um, it also helps to give specific and relevant feedback to students. And hopefully in time, if we can get more modules using this rubric, the students will, will understand the criteria. They will understand the feedback coming from those criteria and, and become more engaged in this reflection process themselves. So I'm gonna hand you back there to Tom to conclude. Uh, thanks, Seymour. So yeah, just a few things just to conclude. And 
Emer mentioned some of the key kind of developments as a result of us engaging in the project. And I think one of them is there just to highlight is that, you know, we got a standardized flexible tool that can be adapted by lecture as required. So, you know, staff can take out teams or criteria, or they can add teams or criteria based on, on what they what skill set they want the students to, to come away with. I think as well, it gives a standardized criteria to teach the students during the module and also in kind of subsequent modules. So because we had this very defined, clear list of criteria, we could then use that to teach the students during the module. So you saw demonstrations there, if that's a focus, it allows us to kind of maybe have a four more focused and considered approach to give them feedback. So this week we're looking at demonstrations. Let's look at the key criteria in demonstrations and give the students in class feedback about that one might look like. And these rubrics as well as like, I suppose maybe most, any rubric that you can use maybe to get students to assess the peers um, during the, the module so that they had a kind of in terms of formative assessment. So I think that gave them a good understanding of what the criteria was and maybe have a look at what their peers are doing well or what they need to improve on. And also at the end of the module, we would have given students an opportunity to self-reflect. Maybe they would have given, we would have handed them out the rubric and pen and paper and asked them to fill in and give them feedback around what they have said. Or else maybe we sent them some groups module of the e an email of the rubric and they sent it back to us. And I think that's a really positive starting point for, for students if, if you're going to give them reflect and uh, give them an opportunity to reflect or, or give them feedback. So overall, I think this project has been very positive in terms of feedback from the staff and students. The idea of co-creating, giving the students um autonomy in terms of what could go in and uh, help it allowing them to help us maybe identify the key criteria and giving them a little bit of ownership around that and also kind of engaging staff around how do we enhance our, our, our feedback and our assessment practices as a, you know, as a program team and across MTU in general. So just a few thanks to finish off. First of all, huge thanks to Teaching and Learning Unit and MTU for the support. We got this funding through what's called a Project Reimagining Assessment and Feedback Together project here. And that's supported by a national funding and um, through the national forum. Um, and this allows us to, you know, engage in these projects and maybe make change happen in a positive way. Really big thanks to students and staff from the departments for engaging in the project. You know, they, they, they shared rubrics with us. They, they met us. They got involved in focus groups. The students invested in the project. And I think that's a really positive way of engaging with students and building positive relationships and, and making the, the, the space very engaging and rewarding and finally to uh, teen and everyone in southeastern finland university of applied sciences for hosting the webinar so back over to you teen and if anyone has any questions you are welcome to take them now thank you very much tom i really liked uh, the your student-centered approach to the whole project and the rubric can be used for so many different purposes for assessment and also for self-assessment by the students and for peer assessment, because very often we lack tools and methods for, for uh, good and productive self-assessment and peer assessment. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments? I have a question, if possible. Uh, yeah. So you were asking for the satisfaction, let's say, to the students with the rubric, and there were some of them that they were not agreeing or strongly agreeing. Did you get any other feedback apart from the numerical input? So do you know the reasons for the why they didn't like it? Or I think, um, thanks, Ignacio. Um, it, the challenge when you're trying to evaluate within the semester is that often the feedback or the rubrics are coming at the very end of the semester. So there is a challenge to engage, you know, in real time with the students. Um, and I think, this, you know, often the students then trying to get them to evaluate, you know, without having any ethical crossover you know with their results that that's a really big challenge um but but yes absolutely i think you know while this is very positive we have a lot of learnings from this as well um the co-creation piece is interesting because 
the, the criteria, I suppose we need to drive the criteria, but I think we can co-create in a, you know, it's maybe slightly pretending to co-create because we, we have the, the criteria almost already. But I think the students, given the, the forum to, to provide their version of those criteria, they're very similar they might just use a little bit different language to to uh, to describe the criteria. So I think it's good to have the criteria, but maybe not share with the students at the start and get them to identify the criteria first, and then you know maybe add to add to maybe anything that they are missing with with our criteria. It become it, it is almost the same we have found in our experience. They come up with very similar, um. But but absolutely, I take your point. We, we need to look more at the students that are maybe not engaging or maybe need a different type of, of feedback for their maybe their learning needs. Yes, makes sense. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. If you have any further questions for Tom and Emer, please write them in the chat. And um, I will now give the floor to, to Magnus. Thank You're on. Thank you very much, Tina. So I will share my screen here. Um, like that. So thank you very much. Uh, I will um, give you, I will talk about the, some of the courses that we've had for yeah, students in the midst of their professional life, meaning students being approximately or age uh, and uh, <clears throat> the question uh, at least we have it in Sweden and I guess you have the same issue in, in your countries uh, okay you have your your job and you can't just tell them okay just take two or three years off and have a new degree you need to have the possibility to get new knowledge but you will you will um, need to continue your your professional life at the same time. So um, I will share some of our uh, experiences of this, how we met these students um, being 40, 50 years old-ish. Uh, so you, if we go back, I mean, when, when we went into the university, maybe the working life looked like this. We had some education, then we got into our professional life and then we got to retirement. But today it work, It looks more like this. I mean, during professional life, you more or less continuously need to get new knowledge uh, to validate your the knowledge. Uh, there's new technology, new methodology that you, that you need to uh, be updated on. And also you can see that we continue to work longer and also by the end we don't just quit and retire we may go go down in not work full time half time and even when we get retired we might want to get some new knowledge and new experiences so i think also academy has to adapt to these new ways and when we've done this we've had some of the pedagogical starting points um, is uh, learning by doing that Dewey uh, has talked about and also that Schoen and others has talked about reflective practice and the re reflective practioneer, meaning that you learn both from experience and reflection and uh, an uh, and ism that We're not now just focus, focusing practice. These two needs to be combined. And that's what we try to do, at least. Of course, when, when you do this, uh, you say that, OK, we should have learning by doing. And then you have distance courses, meaning that the courses are online. Uh, but then, of course, we don't have any labs. So then it's hard to say, OK, how can you learn by doing when you don't have the labs. Of course, that's a pedagogical 
challenge. But what we've tried to do is that when we set up these courses, we focus a lot on reflection and discussion, how experience, theory, and practice connect and how these three can support each other. Uh, and the important here is that we are, the students are professional. They, they have a lot of uh, experience. They have a lot of, most of them um, uh, are in, in their everyday working life. They meet these challenges and they have the, a lot of equipment. And I also say we are mainly focusing uh, manufacturing uh, companies or people within manufacturing companies here. But we've also had others from um, uh, public organizations, for example. The examples here are taken from four different online courses. Uh, the uh, um, size of them are three ECTS, and they have been giving uh, during 2020 up to, to last year. And the core courses are technical leadership for industry and change, technical leadership for the industrial processes of the future, technology, technologies within industry 4.0, and industrial digital transformation. And the courses, the structure of the courses uh, looks a little bit like this. Uh, they are giving online, uh, no physical meetings, and the ordinary time for a course is 10, maybe 12 weeks for some courses. Uh, and we use uh, Canvas as a course's web page and all the uh, documentation of the course, uh, films, recorded lectures, et cetera, et cetera, are, are found in Canvas. And then the course is divided into weekly modules, as you see to the right here. You can see the, the left column is what, what the structure of the course would look like. Um, when they um, enter the uh, web page, they will first find the, some general information uh, of the course and also a module that they could access before the uh, course actually starts. And then you can see for, for each week, you could say you have one module and each of the modules has a theme. And for example, if we look at module for the week number four, continuous improvement in this case, you can see what what is the content of what is the typical content of a of a module? Yeah, we usually have a recorded lecture. Um, the teacher uh, of the week or the teacher of the of the course has recorded a lecture, 15, 20 minutes. In this case, uh, talking about continuous improvements, we have some lecture documents, as I call it, could be the PowerPoint slides or some other notes. We also usually have some additional uh, course material. Uh, in this case, it's a recorded interview with some company representatives about how they work with continuous improvement. Uh, and it's also a documentation about the, the Scania production system. And uh, Scania is very, very famous for just move, uh, working with the continuous improvement. So for that, it's uh, very typical uh, talking to Scania. And also each week we have something that we call live. Live is an online seminar. It's um, it's not mandatory that you have to be there, but uh, it's open for the students that have the possibility and can um, join. And usually during these lives, we have um, the course coordinator and a guest lecturer of the week attending. They have a discussion about the the uh, the theme of the week and the students have possibility to to ask questions give examples uh, they are giving questions by the um, by the teachers that they can reflect on and yeah we have an ongoing discussion and also of course we have the possibility to discuss other course matters like the upcoming um, examinations etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and also, we uh, here we have some of the, um, uh, when we have the uh, courses evaluation, uh, we get some free text um, answers uh, from, from the students. And here are some of the, uh, what the students wrote about these uh, lives and the discussions that we've had. So we've seen that they really uh, like them 
And um, as you see, I look forward to our live discussions on Friday. Uh, so they have become, I would say, much of the backbone of the um, of the course. Uh, we also record these live. Uh, and since if you don't have the possibility to to join, you could uh, go into the courses webpage afterwards and look at the recording. And then, so then you don't miss any of the uh, the discussions or the um, or the further discussions between the teachers or if there had been a very short presentation or something like that. But the main thing that the, the students lift when we talk about live are the discussions. Also the examinations, because we thought about this, uh, how, how can we do, how can we perform the examinations so they should be an event of learning, not just that we assess the students, look if they know what they should know, but how can we set up the examination so it's uh, yeah also an event of learning. So what we've done is that we've based the examination much on discussion, analysis, and reflection that are based on the student's own experience and, and uh, reflections. It could be, for example, in, in the course technologies within Industry 4.0. Uh, in the course, we, um, we dig into some, some of the new technologies like uh, cyber physical systems, uh, augmented reality, uh, internet of things, et cetera, et cetera. And then the students uh, for the examination should um, reflect on, okay, at my work, what are the new upcoming technologies that we could use? What are the technologies that we use and how can we use them even better? And what are other technologies could we gain from using? And then they present this uh, to a smaller group of students. They have some other students also attending these seminars. And then after the um, um, presentation is finished, the, th the students discuss. And when the discussion is finished, the next student presents his or her case. Uh, and usually during this uh, uh, presentation and examination, it's not the problem that okay, we have a lot of time left. <laughs> it's more of, okay, you need to stop your discussion now so the next one can have his or her presentation. So that's uh, also working well, I would say. Finally, I have some of my own reflections also. Um, and what we've seen is that uh, generally there is a lower throughput of these online courses for professionals if we compare to to campus courses. Usually it's, uh, we see that the dropouts are that, yeah, there is so much to do at work. So I, unfortunately I'm not able to, to finalize the course because usually they do it on their free time. But as you know, work uh, tends to take more and more time. Uh, and we've built these courses on uh, the students' existing knowledge. So we, where are you today? What are the technologies? What's your experience within leadership, for example, depending on the focus of the course? Then we try to add much reflection. We give them theory. We ask them to reflect, uh, depending on your knowledge, on your situation, how do you think you could apply these theories? Um, are they useful or not, for example? And this leads to new knowledge and, and insights, I would say, and not only for the students. The discussions are very valuable, I would say. It's also really fun and it's really good discussions. And I would say as, as a teacher, I also really enjoy this and it gives me also me new, new knowledge and some, some um, possibilities. Okay, maybe I could do like that in, in the next course. So I will really take this example uh, and I could use it in other courses, not telling the details from which company, of course. And also, I would say, uh, if we didn't have these online courses, these students would not have the possibility to study at all, because they would be, if we call it, stuck at work. We can't just tell them, okay, just take uh, three or four months off, quit your job, and uh, attend the university. It's not possible. So I, for me, I would say it's very important that we have this possibility to, to, to offer these online courses to the students. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Mangus.
I just have one question on one detail. You have very, very nicely adopted the principle of assessment for learning mm -hmm. in your final exams. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you give grades to the students or is it pass and fail or how? Yes, it, 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 it's pass and fail on these courses. All right. Yeah, uh, and it, it's a little bit different on maybe other worlds, but in Sweden it's pretty common with pass or fail or pass, uh, fail, pass and uh, pass with distinction. Okay. Uh, but we've made a, um, a decision on these courses aiming for professionals that most of them are just pass or fail. All right. Yeah. Thank it's you. Also, it's also very short courses, it's only three ECTS. Mm. Yeah. So usually the examination is uh, one presentation and one, which is a seminar, and one uh, written report that is based on reflections. Okay, but I like yeah. the idea of that kind of an example. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? I, I might just make a comment. Thank you, Magnus. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the term event of learning examination. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really nice term to use. And I, I, I plan to steal it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's free um, to you. <laughs> yes. um, I, 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 more of a, a suggestion. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the live discussion is obviously, you know, one of the really um, engaging parts of this, you know, mm -hmm. that you will use. Um, have you ever thought about maybe the students um, getting credit for organizing a live discussion. So I've, I have done that before with, with mature learners where mm. they've had to organize a speaker maybe for their live session. So mm. perhaps, you know, they could be given maybe a little bit more um, of a role possibly in that running that live discussion. It may be just a, mm. it's more, more of a suggestion than a question. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've had students uh, on these online courses saying, "Okay, can't we? Uh, can we come to Kuvda? <laughs> can we meet? Can we have other discussions?" So they see a need of it and they would like it. The problem to have an examination is that that not all of them have the possibility since they work some day, some night. Um, so yeah, until now we haven't been able to achieve that. But uh, we have some students asking for, could we have more interaction between students? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Shaima, for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have time for one quick question, if somebody wants to ask something. Do you have um, Magnus in uh, contact information in the chat, right? Uh, I, yeah, I can send it there. Okay, if you write yeah. your email there, yeah. there. So you can ask any further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, before you go, I will just share... Hang on a minute. One single slide with you. So this was now the last webinar this spring, but we shall carry on in the autumn in October. Uh, we will have three Staff Academy webinars. So uh, take a note of the dates and uh, encourage your colleagues to join because uh, we have had excellent uh, methods presented here, new innovations. And if you want to book a webinar, you will find all the details on, on the Ingenium website under Staff Academy. So thank you very much for your active participation. And I hope to see you again in October. And I want to wish you all a very nice summer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tina. Thank you. Bye See you. Bye. Thanks. See you in Bye, Bye bye. Thank you. Have a nice summer.